You're listening to Blue Jays Nation Radio with Cam Lewis and Tyler Uremchuk, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts. Episode 189 of Blue Jays Nation Radio presented by Botano. Maybe you're looking to get in on a little NHL action or the NBA midseason tournament. That definitely doesn't feel like a sham. You can do it all at Botano. The game starts now at Botano.ca 19 plus. Please play responsibly. We are back after a little playoff baseball hiatus because we both sat here and said, holy shit, either an entire offseason of talking about the Rangers being World Series champions or an entire offseason of Gabby Moreno discourse. We didn't want any part of that, Kumzi. So we just sat it out for a couple weeks. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's uh, it's pretty staggering that the Texas Rangers winning the World Series was the preferred result. But the entire discourse around that trade single-handedly. And then, of course, there's also the whole new angle that people unearthed, which was that Tori Lovello was, you know, the masterclass manager the Blue Jays lost and should have had, blah, blah, blah. The discourse around this stuff is just brutal. I never want to talk about that trade ever again. I'm <laughs> Unfortunately, I would have liked cheering for the Diamondbacks as they were a fun underdog team. But, man, I'm not going to lie. The, the discourse just sort of ruined it. So... Texas Rangers are champs, and that was the outcome I was cheering for, which feels completely insane. I don't know what we're going to say now because, you know, the, the whole joke forever was the Texas Rangers have never won the World Series. So what do we do? Yeah. The best moment in their franchise's history is officially no longer the roof net overdoer punch, even though nah. they, they honestly still might act like it. That still might get played more than the World Series win. That'd be funny, yeah. yeah. Um, around. This is why, if we want to talk about the World Series a little bit, obviously Texas beats Arizona in five games. It was a dull World Series. Like, neither of those stadiums really had great vibes in them. Like, if the Jays aren't going to go deep, I honestly kind of wish it would have been a team like Philly or someone with a bit more of a rabid fan base. Like, they had that shot of the watch party that the Rangers were having at their stadium. It looked like there was like 9,000 people there. Like, your team's about to win the World Series and no one wanted to go watch it in the stadium. Um, But the reason I think this is a good or a perfect World Series for diehard baseball fans is because every fan base in the league can take a positive from it. If you're a team who is shit and your ownership is cheap as hell, you can look at the Arizona Diamondbacks and go, you know what? In two years, you can turn it around. And as long as you get in, you'll always have a chance. And if you're a team with a very rich owner who's right on the cusp, the Toronto Blue Jays, you can look at the Rangers and go, oh, it is actually possible to buy a World Series. Jays fans should be sitting here going, spend up, dish out another $100 million this offseason, Rodgers, because you can, in fact, they spent half a billion dollars on their middle infield alone with Seager and Semyon. If you spend money, you can win. Yeah, it's it's that's definitely the best conclusion to draw from this. I mean, like you said with the Diamondbacks, if you're a fan of a small market money ball team, then you're like, you know what? Yeah, this is good. I can my team can win 84 games, squeeze into the playoffs. A handful of players get hot at the right time and it all works out. And that's great. I think that's the parody that baseball is looking for. This is, you know, we're, we're, we're both people that follow the NHL and we've seen the amount of number eight and number seven seeds to go on deep runs of the playoffs. And that's what the league is looking for. Ultimately, you want more teams in the mix, more fans that believe their teams can win more teams buying at the deadline, blah, blah, blah. And then from Texas's perspective, it's easy to forget that like this, this is a team Last year, they only won 68 games, and it's not like last offseason was the one where they signed Corey Seager and Marcus Semien. That was after 2021. They put down the five, six hundred million dollars to sign those two guys ahead of 2022, fell completely flat, didn't even just miss the playoffs, but completely missed, not even close. And then what do they do in the offseason again is they spend a whole bunch more money. Jacob deGrom, they go with the trade deadline, Max Scherzer, uh, Native Aldi. They just continue spending money and throwing at it to solve their problems. So, I mean, if you're a Blue Jays fan, that's the only thing you really need to take from the Texas Rangers winning the World Series is go out and spend money and fill your holes. And that's what we all hope the Blue Jays are going to do this offseason. Yeah, we uh, will talk about a whole bunch of offseason topics in just a second. The other big thing to come from the World Series is, of course, we joked about it off the top. Gabby Moreno establishes himself as a first ballot Hall of Famer in, uh, in a matter of just a couple of weeks. I mean... The guy hits a couple of postseason home runs and everyone's ready to anoint him the second coming of Pudge Rodriguez. Yeah, I think um, there was someone that referred to him as Buster Posey Jr. I mean, of course, um, as I had Tim Lincecum right behind me, Buster Posey was the catcher as the Giants won three World Series in the course of what was that, five or six years. I mean, Gabby Moreno could become that guy. I don't think anybody's disagreeing with that, but to anoint him that after one playoff run, albeit a good playoff run, like a really nice debut in the playoffs, but I mean... 
look, the Blue Jays also have a catcher who has um, some pretty spectacular numbers in the playoffs as well. Danny Jansen's career OPS in the playoffs is uh, 1,300. Got two bombs against the Tampa Bay Rays back there in 2020 in his playoff debut. So, I don't know. The Jays might have their uh, Buster Posey Jr. there themselves too. But I think the other thing to kind of draw from this playoffs, and I kind of touched on this uh, as we kind of came into talking about it, is there's going to be so much more randomness now. I mean, the way the playoffs used to be set up was there would be just a small amount of teams. It was very difficult to make the playoffs. There was eight of them. And among those eight, you can expect these are all very strong teams. It's very hard to get there. But now that you've expanded the field to have six per league, 12 in total, like the the, the reality of baseball is there's just an extreme amount of randomness. And at any time, anyone can win a three or a five game series. And we're going to see good teams like the L.A. Dodgers get knocked out right away. Good teams like the Baltimore Orioles, the Tampa Bay Rays, they get knocked out right away. And there doesn't have to be a sweeping conclusion to draw from any of these things. It's just... <laughs> It's, it's it's baseball and that's what happens in short series and you just have to get in and we hated hearing that from Ross Atkins a month ago I you and I were on the same page it was an unfortunate thing to hear it was it's it's not it's not it's not that sexy response you're looking for but what he says isn't really wrong at the end of the day if you get into the playoffs a bunch of times in a row you're one of these times you're probably going to punch through and win. And I can remember being a Blue Jays fan from a long time, 1994 until 2015. They didn't make the playoffs once. So the fact that they've been in the mix for three, four years in a row, and it looks like they should be in the mix moving forward. I think it's something positive. I think, I think that we, we should be in a better headspace now than we were a few weeks ago. Yeah, I, I agree with that. The interesting, I guess, dichotomy to these two teams winning is that you can really make a case for either side. And that's what I find so interesting. Like, Yes, the Rangers just spent, 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 got to the deadline, went all in, kept spending, and they won a World Series. But there is also an interesting argument to be made of, no, don't blow out a bunch of prospects and spend at the deadline. Don't move a bunch of prospects in the offseason to go make a big splash. If you keep your window open long enough, eventually you will just get through, whether you're an 86-win team or a 105-win team. Once it gets to October, you really have the same chance of going all the way. So... Yeah, it'll be interesting to see kind of how teams respond to this because baseball, like every other pro sports league, it's a copycat league. Teams look at who had the most success and go, okay, how can we replicate that? But obviously the interesting part here is that there's two very different ways to replicate the successful seasons from the AL winner and the NL winner. Um, so let's get into the offseason talk a little bit here. Free agency will officially open on Tuesday morning. So before we get to maybe who the Jays could look to add because that is the sexy conversation to have. Let's get some of the heavy lifting out of the way and talk about some of the decisions they have to make with their own guys or guys they could be losing um, qualifying offers. It sounds like Matt Chapman's getting one. Scott Mitchell from TSN reporting and a handful of other ha others have as well. I am fully expecting him to be the only guy. Like I know Kevin Kiermaier is a possibility, but I don't see the Jays giving him a QO. No, Kevin Kiermeyer, of course, wasn't offered a qualifying, uh, issued a qualifying offer last year from the Tampa Bay Rays. That's, you know, obviously Tampa's not going to pay a guy one year, $20 million or whatever it was last year for a QO. It takes the, the average of the top 125 salaries in Major League Baseball. I think this year it's just a shade under 21 million. It's 20.5 or something like that. So you have to ask yourself, do you want to spend whatever percentage of your budget that is maybe say you're a 200 million dollar team that's 10 percent of your budget on kevin kiermeyer he was a fantastic player for the blue jays this year in the one year show me contract but there's also a pretty significant track record of injuries i think we've all kind of accepted that it's going to be a one and done for kiermeyer because he wants to play somewhere else where he doesn't have to be on turf which is completely valid he's spent his entire career at the trop in the rogers center and there probably isn't anything worse in major league baseball on your ankles and knees than that so him leaving makes a lot of sense fair enough um the other ones brandon belt's already been qualified before by the giants as has Hun Hunjin ryu was qualified by the dodgers before they can't qualify jordan hicks because they traded for him at the deadline you have to have the player for the full season so I mean, for me, the only one is Chapman very easily. And I think, I mean, even though he had a terrible finish to the season, he's going to net more than 20 mils in free agency. So whether the Blue Jays sign him or not, I don't know. I, I don't see anyone accepting a qualifying offer from the Blue Jays. No, I, I don't see that either. As, as much as we kind of talked a little bit towards the end of the year when he was really, really struggling, oh, maybe Chapman does take a one-year deal and try to go into free agency again next year with a bit more value. You look at the bats and the free agent position players that are available. I mean, Otani, Bellinger, 
And then it's probably Chapman. Like yeah. I know I was reading an article from Sportsnet that ranked the top 10 and like Lourdes Gurriel was number four behind Chapman. Like he's in the upper echelon. He'll get himself a couple hundred million dollars, I think, or, you know, yeah. 125, 150 million bucks. I think at this point, if you're Matt Chapman, you're probably looking for the same contract that George Springer signed a few years ago. Just, you know, you're one of the top names out there. Even if your bat doesn't come through like it does this year, you're still you're still a good hitter. You're still, you know, a 750 OPS, hit a bunch of home runs, still a gold glove caliber defender. So there's obviously value in that. I'm just not sure if the Blue Jays are going to be the team to sign that contract. And there's other places they would spend their money because you 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 heard Atkins talk after they got knocked out of the playoffs. And one of the things they were most excited about was they had all this depth where they felt they could fill the positions of the players who were going to be leaving. And he kind of accidentally did the uh, Freudian slip thing where he said, oh, uh, we're going to miss these guys. Ha ha, even though they're not quite gone yet circled back on it and said he didn't mean it but i think we all know the free agents are gone so the thing the jays are excited about is they have all these internal options you have david schneider spencer horowitz or elvis martinez has been playing second base in the dominican winter league i mean addison barger of course is a name we were all talking about last winter there's a lot of internal options for the jays to fill these infield positions so i think it'll be somewhere else that they spend the money yeah, I agree with you. And the nice thing, again, we, we talked about this, I think on the last pod we did, is we're not sitting here crossing our fingers for just one young player to come up and fill a spot and like, okay, this guy has to hit for the Jays to be competitive next year. There's four options. And when you look again at who's still on this team, there's a lot of young talent that's going to be returning next year. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit later. I'm um, just kind of working our way through the offseason checklist here. Uh, Whit Merrifield's $18 million option not being picked up by the Jays But then Merrifield's camp comes out and says, oh, no, we weren't accepting the option either, which I think is hilarious because I believe that guy would have taken a one year, 18 million dollar contract. Yeah, it'd be really stunning if uh, I mean, look, and I'll preface this by saying Whit Merrifield was an excellent pickup for the Jays. He was an all star. He is somehow a silver slucker nominee this season. The only one on the Blue Jays, which is very fitting for the season that just happened. Uh, He was a he was a solid Blue Jay for what they gave up and what they paid him. But man, if there's a team out there that pays Whit Merrifield at this point more than 18 million dollars, I guess. Sure. Fair enough. It's not going to be the Blue Jays, though. I did see quite a few people on social media responding with pictures of Marcus Simeon um, in response to the Jays declining the option on Whit Merrifield. And it's like, okay, yeah, (laughs) these are the same things. Whit Merrifield's going to earn, you know, $250 million in free agency and lead a team to the World Series. You got it. Um, Yeah, so Whit's gone. Um, There was interest from the Chicago White Sox. Apparently, they're a team who, of course, knows him very well because he played with the Kansas City Royals. Uh, This was a no-brainer for me. It is funny that he came out and said, oh, yeah, I'm declining this as well because it seems kind of like someone, like, you know, gets broken up with and they come back and say, oh, no, it was mutual. (laughs) It really doesn't seem like it was. Yeah, or like, you know, when a head coach or a GM gets fired and it's like, oh, it's a mutual parting of ways. And it's like, well, oh, I'm sure. Dorian, yeah, he, he just parted sure. ways with the Sens. <laughs> yeah, are you sure about that? Um, the more interesting one, like Merrifield cut and dried, not coming back. Chad Green, be, and remember last season when they signed him, it was kind of like we liked the bet because of the flexibility it gave the Jays after this season with him. So there's a few options here. There's a one-year $6.25 million player option. So Chad Green is guaranteed at least 6.25 in a way. The Jays have a couple options, though. They could exercise a two-year $21 million option, or they could exercise a three-year $27 million option. He only threw 12 innings for them last season in the regular regular season, that is, coming off injury. He looked good in a few of them. I think he's a guy who could contribute. I'm a little, like... On one hand, two years, 21 mil, it's like, yeah, you'll look at Chad Green. He's a 32-year-old reliever. We know relievers are volatile. Why would you want to lock in for three years of that? But also, three years, 27 million versus, you know, 10 and a half per season? I don't know. I think maybe the two-year option is the way to go. What do you think? Yeah, so it starts off with three years, 27 million, plus there's also 1 million of incentives that season, each season. So in total to be $30 million in total, which seems like a lot. The Jays, this front office hasn't handed out a contract like that to a reliever. And you'd think that if they had the appetite to do so, they'd probably, you know, earmark that money for Jordan Hicks, who's we also mentioned a minute ago as a free agent. Uh, So if that one 
gets declined, which the Jays, I think we're all certain, will decline that one. He gets the one-year player option worth 6.25 mils with an additional $2 million in incentives that season. So potentially an 8.25 one-year deal. It wouldn't be surprising if he accepted that one because then, you know, you can have a solid season and go back into free agency right away, try and make some more cash. And it's not really 100% certain because if he declines that and the Jays can pick up the two-year $21 million option and are the Jays going to invest that? So if you're Chad Green, you can kind of guarantee yourself $6.25 million one-year show-me deal with the Jays. I think that's the option that makes the most sense. I, I just I don't see this front office dedicating that much money to a pitcher who he looked fine coming off of Tommy John. It's pretty hard to draw a conclusion because it really wasn't very many appearances, but he looked solid. But it's a lot of money to dedicate for a front office who they don't really spend that much money on the bullpen. Yeah, and especially when you mentioned Jordan Hicks. Like, there is a clear-cut guy that you would rather yeah. spend money on in your bullpen, so why would you go 27 to $30 million on Chad Green when, yeah, bite the bullet, give him his eight, give him a one-year show-me deal, take the rest of that money, and sign Jordan Hicks. Like, I think signing Jordan Hicks should be a priority this this winter. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's certainly something to talk about. I've seen, I've seen a lot of people um, mention, and I, I haven't been able to really confirm this anywhere, but there's been a bunch of talk among, amongst Cardinals fans, Blue Jays fans, that Jordan Hicks wants to sign a contract with a team that will let him try and start in the future, which seems weird because he's only ever been a reliever at the major league level. So, I mean, he has the pitch repertoire potentially to be a good starter, but I just don't really know why you you try and change that. But I mean, if, if Hicks does want to be a starter, I don't think it really works with the Blue Jays necessarily because his role in this team would obviously be as the eighth inning guy before Romano. But um, the other thing to consider also with, with Hicks is Jordan Romano is coming close to free agency. And that's a, you know, homegrown local player that everyone likes. Are you going to sign Jordan Hicks and then let Romano walk in free agency shortly later? Is Romano going to get a qualifying offer? Like lots of decisions that are made this off season will be big one, like have effects on what they do down the road. So I agree with you that bringing Jordan Hicks back would be huge. But I think if you're Ross Atkins and you're making that decision, you, you look at what that means for Romano, because that's going to be a hard one. If the Jays let Romano walk in free agency, fans aren't going to be happy with that. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, a fan favorite Canadian boy, Roger center goes red every time he comes in. Like, yeah, that would be a little ugly. Before we talk about, and it kind of ties into the Jordan Hicks thing a little bit because we're talking about pitchers in the rotation. But before we talk about outside options in free agency, is it fair to say that the number one domino or like decision number one the Jays need to make this winter is what they want to do with Alec Manoa? Like if you think Alec Manoa is coming back and you're going to give him a shot to pitch in the majors, then your rotation is set already for next season, right? And you don't need to worry about any of that. If you decide that, you know what, this relationship is broken beyond repair, we need to move on from this guy, then that opens up a whole different web of possibilities of, do you just trade him for another young starter? Do you trade him for a bat and then go sign a pitcher? Like, what they want to do with Alec Manoa, that is, I mean, maybe they've already made the decision, we haven't heard anything, but like, they kind of need to figure that out before they figure anything else out. Yeah, that's a that's a big one, is you have four starters who are forming the rotation next year that you know are going to be there because they're all signed. You have Kevin Gosman, Jose Barrios, Chris Bassett, and Yusei Kikuchi. Kikuchi's in the last year of his contract. Everybody else still has term after that. So you you pretty much have a good chunk of your rotation locked up decently long term. And then the, the one open spot is the fifth. And I think if you sign a veteran starter, you add go out and say, they had it, for example, like they had interest last winter in Kyle Gibson, who wound up signing with Baltimore. You go out and bring in a guy like that to be your number five, like an innings muncher, then are you starting with Alec Manoa as the number six, given the way things went this year with all we've heard about them having beef over service time, him not wanting to go down to AAA? Are you comfortable that he's going to be going down to Buffalo at the start of April to potentially work his way up as an injury replacement? I mean, that's a pretty weird situation, but... I mean, what can you do? Like, we, we talked about this in the previous podcasts in the past when all the drama was happening during the season. I mean, how do you trade Alec Manoa this offseason? It's hard to imagine having less value in a trade than right now, given the season that he just had. And it's a, just a terrible risk to take where you're going to, I guess, trade him for another reclamation project, trade him for another guy who wants to be traded, that kind of thing. And then he bounces back with another team like, that's a really tough one. I mean, I think that if you're the Blue Jays and you think that the relationship is irreconcilable, like it's broken and it's irreconcilable, then you have to, I guess, let him try to rebuild his value next year and then trade him in the future. I think if you're trading him this winter, you're you're not going to win that trade. There's 
it's, it's really hard to see that going well for you. And then next year, Alec Manoa is an NL Cy Young candidate for the St. Louis Cardinals. And we're all sitting here no. God damn it, Atkins. What the fuck? For the Diamondbacks, of course. Yeah, yeah. Pitching to Gabby Moreno and he wins. And then, yeah. Don't That's know. exactly how it would go. Uh, the only thing I'd say, like, maybe where you could wait and see is if you want to take some big swings on starters or I'll say potential starters. Like, if you can get Yoshinobu Yamamoto. I'm obsessed yeah. with this guy. I spent, like, the whole morning getting ready for this podcast, going and, like, watching highlights and shit. He's nasty, man. Like he's, he's in four straight seasons or something. He's an ERA below 1.7 in Japan. He's sick. He's probably going to get a contract around $200 million or more. But man, if you could get that guy, yeah, I'd be, you know what? Trade Manoa for whatever. If you can bring that guy into your rotation. You can also consider trading other players in the rotation as well. Like, I mean, Kikuchi's only one year from free agency and there's a team that needs pitching. Swap them out for, you know, think about a, a, a Similar trade like last year with Seattle going and getting Tay Oscar, who's one year away from free agency. The go the Jays go and swap Kikuchi out for a bat like that. Maybe that makes sense if you really do believe in Manoa bouncing back and you can add a great starter like that. Because the thing with the Jays is, yeah, the rotation's set for next season, but there's worry that they can't be the same rotation next year they were this year. There's no guarantee that Kikuchi has that season again. There's no guarantee that Chris Bassett has that season again. Everyone These are all guys in their 30s. What? Everyone stays healthy. Yeah, exactly. The Jays hardly had any injuries last year. Yeah. It was They had a really, really good bill of health, like the 2016 team. You don't see that very often. So, I mean, it wouldn't be crazy for them to say, look, we got a little bit lucky with our rotation this year. Why don't we go and upgrade and sell high on somebody else? It does make some sense. Yeah. Uh, the other big, big name that I think would drastically change your offseason plans is obviously Shohei Otani. Oh, yeah. I, listen, I love it because Twitter's just great and Jays fans are like obsessed with the idea of it as we should be. Um, I will say 2% chance. Yeah, that's that sounds about right. I'm going to I'm optimistic. So I'm going to say like 5%. There was a tweet came out from an account. I think it was Blue Jays hot stove that said um, he has a source within the organization that 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 indicated that. Rogers would have a different budget mapped out for signing a unicorn player. And Otani would fall under that, of course, because he's the best player in the league, perhaps the best player of all time. The, you know, the MVP caliber hitter, who's also an above average starter, though he is going undergoing elbow surgery in the off season. So he's not going to pitch until 2025, but given the discussion we just had, if you're, if there is a team who doesn't really give a shit, if someone's not pitching next year, it's the Jays because they pretty much have the rotation mapped out. So you just add Otani's bat for next year. The Jays would love to have a big lefty in the middle of their lineup. Um, and then you get him pitching after that when other contracts are coming off the books, think Kikuchi, maybe by then you've made a Manoa trade, something like that. Who knows? It makes all kind of sense. Rogers has the cash, man. They have an infinite bank account. They, they can make this happen. Uh, but I think the biggest question ultimately is, does Shoei Otani have interest in coming to Toronto? I think there was a comment that came out um, shortly after they got knocked out of the playoffs. I think that he 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 had said that he was impressed with their player development stuff in Dunedin, the facility. So maybe that could lure him here. But I personally have a hard time imagining him leaving the West Coast. I, he's not going to stay with Anaheim, of course, but I think the Dodgers, the Mariners, the Giants, one of those three teams probably makes the most sense. But... I don't think the Jays are impossible. I put them as like a top five or six possible destination. I think it, it makes yeah. sense. I agree with you. Like, okay. The Dodgers obviously very high on that list. You mentioned the Mariners. They're obviously very high on that list. Um, the Yankees are always going to make him an offer and be able to offer him boatloads of money just to try to get that to happen. Um, there was a weird little bit amount of smoke about the Red Sox. I remember like four months ago, I want to say, and the New Balance president or whatever, and him having a relationship. Um, but I think the Jays are probably just as likely as any other team in the American League East. I think that's fair, right? Like if he's going to come yeah. out this way, then Toronto is just as good of a chance as I think maybe a team like Boston does. I agree. I don't think there, there's that much difference between what the Jays, Red Sox, and Yankees would offer Otani or the fit, to be honest with you. Yeah. All right. We're going to talk about some other maybe outside of Toronto options and also go through some arbitration numbers. But first, we're going to step aside for a quick break. All right. Episode 189, continuing along with our little offseason primer here. Free agency gets rolling on Tuesday. Uh, Blue Jays Nation Radio brought to you by Botano and our friends at Botano.ca. You can head out over there, check out all the latest odds on NFL football as we're about halfway through the NFL season, NBA, NHL. They got it all. The game starts now. 
with Batano. A um, couple other notable players. We talked about Whit Merrifield in air quotes, declining his player option as well. <laughs> Some guys outside of Toronto that are also going to become free agents. Joey Votto is an interesting one. Oh, yeah. We talk about just one vibes. We love vibes. Two, replacing Brandon Belt. I mean, there you go. That's the guy, right? Yeah, I mean, look, remember before last season, my predictions were they were going to trade for Otani and Joey Votto, and it made no sense. Well, my prediction this offseason is they're going to sign Otani and they're going to sign Joey Votto. So Joey Votto can be their vent- veteran bench bat, and then, of course, Otani will be the DH, the big lefty they need. But, yeah, the Cincinnati Reds declined the option of Joey Votto today, and in the second paragraph of their announcement on Twitter, it said, at this point of the offseason, based on our current roster and projected plans for 2024, As an organization, we cannot commit to the playing time Joey deserves. He will forever be a part of the Reds family, and at the appropriate time, we will thank him and honor him as one of the greatest baseball players of this generation. So safe to say he's not going back to the Reds. So if Joey Votto wants to keep playing, a homecoming in Toronto would really would make all kinds of sense. I mean, the the that that really is what it's all about. He's perhaps the best Canadian baseball player of all time. He's he's in the conversation. He's he's one of the best. And it'd be cool to see him play for the Jays, whether he would bring, you know, value in terms of hitting home runs or getting on base. At this point, I really don't know, but the vibes would be cool. Like there there aren't very many better veteran players I could imagine having around than Joey Votto. Yeah, I was gonna say, like, if they signed Otani, Rogers probably makes back sixty to seventy million dollars like instantly in Otani jersey sales. If you give Joey Votto ten million dollars this offseason, you're making back four or five million dollars in Joey Votto sales and merch and all of that stuff pretty quickly. Yep. From a baseball perspective, like again, I love the story and I want it so bad. I got a Joey Votto jersey sitting in my in my closet right now. I love the guy. It's probably just smarter to give that time to Spencer Horowitz, right? Yeah, you'd think. I mean, Brandon Belt was a good acquisition for the Jays this year. A nice one-year contract, kind of a placeholder for somebody else. But I think we all kind of recognized as time went along this season, the Jays might have been better off having that DH spot just be open for everybody else. If, you know, if, if the Jays do go back in free agency and add like a Teoscar or a Gurriel, which we, we, we've talked about, I don't think it's unreasonable to assume both players would be good fits. They've both played here. They're both well-liked uh, to add either of those two. But if you did add, add either of them, you'd like to have the DH spot open. So it's left field DH or right field DH, whatever. Same with Springer, same with Bo, same with Vladdy last year. He was in the field almost every day. So, you know, I, I, I think the Blue Jays are better off with an open DH spot, but I, I would really love if there was a way to make Joey Votto work. I just think from the, the, the fan standpoint, like imagine, you know, Joey Votto, Canada Day bobblehead giveaway next season. Like the, it all, the marketing just writes itself, right? Like it's, it's such a perfect fit. I just, the same reason what the Reds are saying here though. It's like, can you really guarantee him the playing time he'd probably want to be looking for? Otherwise, is he just coming to join the team as like a grizzled old vet who sits around with black coffee and tells stories? Like, I don't know. I mean, the latter is fine, but I just don't know if the Jays will guarantee a roster spot for that. A couple other former Jays. Marcus Stroman and Liam Hendricks. I, I, the Stroman thing, I mean, whatever. If you liked him as a Jay, good for you. We just kind of talked about their rotation, though. Like, you're not losing an Alec Manoa trade because you want to bring Marcus Stroman back. Um, Liam Hendricks, though, if there was a scenario where Jordan Hicks is like, hey, I'm good, and you're sitting there as the Jays going, okay, we want one more high-end reliever as Jordan Romano cover, Hendricks would make sense. When's Hendricks? He had an, he had not he it was last his last year's season involved him at the beginning having cancer and then he came yeah. back and then I think he got hurt too and the expectation is that he's going to be back I think late in 2024 so that would be like an investment for the future kind of like when Ken Giles went down and I think Seattle signed him to a multi year contract to hope he comes back I mean these things have happened in the past I remember I think it was the Tampa Bay Rays who did that with Nate Ivaldi he had Tommy John when he was a Yankee and let him go. Tampa gave him the two-year contract and he came back. I mean, of course, we also just saw that the Jays did this with Chad Green. Yeah. And I think it worked out quite well for them. So why not? I, Liam Hendricks was a, was a great Blue Jay. It's a, it's a shame that they traded him away after that season. And then he went on to become that great closer in in Oakland. But Liam Hendricks has always been a been an excellent reliever, an excellent player, well-liked Blue Jay. Another one that I would uh, love to see come do a second tour of duty with the Blue Jays. Yeah, and that's what I was talking about with like Romano cover as well. Is like if you were to do the Chad Green deal with Liam Hendricks, one, he's got a higher ceiling than Chad Green, and he could basically be a free, in air quotes, trade deadline addition. I know we love doing that. Free trade deadline addition for next year if he can come back and pitch late in the season. And then if you have a little $2 million team option tagged on the end of that, and you're like, hey, we really want this guy back, 
boom, it feels like a decent gamble to take. Um, couple position players, because again, like the free agent position player market, like it's relatively thin this year, it especially is. compared to like what we had last year. Um, Jorge Soler is a decent option. I see you have uh, you have written down here Justin Turner. I'm good on Justin Turner. To me, like you said, kind of halfway through the year, we went, okay, Brandon Belt, maybe that time would have been better spent divvying it up. I don't want to lock Justin Turner into my DH spot. He's a declining bat. He's a declining fielder. I just have no interest in that. No, it's a it's an old player. It's the same thing with with the belt and the, the additions like that. I, I don't think they're going to go that same path again. I do think that when it comes to additions and free agency, it'll be a big ad the Jays make rather than a handful of smaller ones like last year. Because I do believe they're more comfortable now with those depth players, Schneider, Horowitz, you know, Ernie Clement, even or, or all this, all those names. I think they're comfortable enough with the depth they have that you don't need to add seven guys in free agency. You can add two. And, you know, go out an arm, go out a big bat. And I think that you hope that everything else works itself out internally. And you hope that the big ad they make is, is a big one, like a real, like an Otani ad. But yeah. it's really hard to say. I just, I don't think that we're going to see the same offseason last year where it's the Jays bringing in a whole bunch of guys on one-year contracts. I think, I think it'll be a different look this year. If I'm going to lock in anybody to like that DH kind of role and commit to the Vladdy Brandon Belt thing, Reese Hoskins is a guy I would actually consider. It, I mean, he's gotten close to 30 dingers pretty much each of the last like five, six seasons here. That's a guy I would have a ton of time for, for the Jays. Again, he'd be splitting time with Vladdy at first, um, but he's pretty high on my list. And we talked on the last pod we did a few weeks ago, Cody Bellinger's without a doubt number yeah. one on my list. Like it's Bellinger for yeah, me. Yeah. And if you're not going to get him, then I kind of check down to guys like Hoskins. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at, too, is you have the big one. That's Otani. I think we both agree that it's a pipe dream that's somewhat possible, probably not going to happen. And then the one that is actually somewhat realistic is Bellinger, who, of course, um, didn't get tendered by the L.A. Dodgers last offseason, went into the open market as kind of one of those big name looking for a one year contract thing. And he wound up going to the Cubs. The Blue Jays were among the teams who we're in the mix. So, I mean, completely different situation for him this year. He had a great season for the Cubs. They gave him a qualifying offer. So there'll be draft pick compensation attached to his name. Um, the Jays, it wouldn't be surprising at all to see them get back into the mix. This is kind of what happened a few years ago with Kevin Gosman. It was the, the after 2019 offseason, the one where they wound up signing Hyunjin Ryu. The Jays were in the mix to sign Gosman to a, a one-year show-me deal, and he wound up signing with San Francisco. Had a good season, gets the qualifying offer, and then becomes a free agent again and inks the five-year deal with the Jays. So I wouldn't be shocked if if the exact same thing happened with Bellinger again this offseason. And that would be a nice ad for the Jays. You you don't lose the defense with with switching Kiermaier to Bellinger, but you gain quite a bit offensively. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about a little bit of arbitration. You've thrown down the projections for a handful of Jays that are courtesy of MLB trade rumors. I'll start because there's, again, about 12, 13 names on this list. The auto, we're not even thinking about these ones. We're just going to let them happen. They got Vladdy at 20.4, Romano at 7.7, .7, and Varsho at 5.5. .5. Lock them in. Yeah, all of those ones are obviously going to be taken, though I will say, like, the Vladdy number is starting to get pretty big. If he has a season like he did last year, 20.4, then it's, uh, oof, oof. Yeah, there's a little bit of pressure on him to, to step up and have a bounce back season. Again, yeah. I've always been someone who says, like, guys are allowed to have bad seasons. Like, yep. look at Cody Bellinger, right? Like, the Dodgers let that guy mm -hmm. go. And now he's the second best hitting free agent on the market this season. So, again, Plenty of time for Vladdy to have a bounce back. I'm not sitting here hitting the panic button, but if we're halfway through last year and the numbers are the same as they were halfway through this year, then I'm with you. It's a little bit like, okay, you're, he's starting to get pricey for what he is. Um, the other name that I think is probably a lock is Tim Mesa, right? 3.3 yeah. million. Like that's such a key part of your bullpen. You're bringing that guy back and 3.3 million feels like a bargain to me, honestly. Yeah, Tim Mesa at 3.3 .3 is an easy one. Another reliever that's easy, Eric Swanson at 2.7. Of course, this is a big reason why they made that trade last year. Very good, cheap reliever. Another one, Genesis Cabrera is only going to make 1.4 million next year projected. Nate Pearson's really cheap at 800 grand, but I think he also isn't optionable starting next season. So we're going to see pretty soon here whether Nate Pearson can get the job done in the big league bullpen. It's kind of like the Julian Merriweather situation now. Either you make it or you don't. You have to go through waivers if you don't, if you're not on the team. So will be interesting to see. The the names that I'm I'm unsure of are um, Trevor Richards at 2.4, Adam Simber at 3.2, 
and Santiago Espinal at 2.5 and Kevin Biggio at 3.7. I think given the way things went late in the season for Biggio, he'll be back. He had a really good finish. He was one of their best players down the stretch. I don't think that's the same case for Espinal because you have other names in the minors. Think like Otto Lopez, Leo Jimenez, Ernie Clement, who I've mentioned a few times already. Uh, mm-hmm. There's just cheaper options internally. So, And then the same thing with the relievers. Maybe there's, I don't know, some some cheaper names from Buffalo they can bring up and they don't want to take the gamble on Simber at 3.2, who was very injury riddled this year, but it's also not that much. It's probably worth a risk. 5.5 between those two relievers really isn't that much. So we'll see. There's a lot of names in the mix. It's It'll be interesting to see how they manage their 40-man roster this offseason. Yeah, I got... There's a part of me that just goes, okay, Simber Richards, 5.6, like not a lot of money for those two. But again, if if you're talking about managing a budget here, which again, it's easy for us to sit here and be like, just spend all the money, bring those guys back, whatever. (laughs) If that 5.6 can help you bring back a Jordan Hicks and give you a little bit more money to up that offer or something like that, I think I would rather just do that. I don't know. Adam Simber was not that great before he got hurt. Uh, the Biggio one I like at 3.7 just because you're losing wit and I think he can be new wit Merrifield, right? Bounces yeah, around the yeah. diamond really, really well, plays a ton of positions, and he gives you a lefty bat in this case as well. So I like that. Espinal, we might be reaching the end of the line there. Uh, the two catchers are on the list with Kirk and Jansen. 2.6 for Kirk, 5.2 for Jansen. Bring them both back. That Those are your guys. It, it's pretty easy. And honestly, like I know we were laughing about the Mourinho thing earlier, but like, it is a bit of a luxury to just have those two catchers and be in like a set it and forget it state when it comes to a pretty important position. Like you can trust them to catch games and call good ball games. That's it. Yeah. I mean, that's ultimately what you want from the catcher. The, the, the Gabby Moreno discourse calms down quite a bit. If Danny Jansen doesn't get hurt in September and finishes off the season strong, or Alejandro Kirk doesn't have the disappointing season he had at the plate in 2023. Like it's easy to forget that. This time last year, Alejandro Kirk won a silver slugger. He was an all-star. Like he's, he's not that far removed from being one of the best young catchers in Major League Baseball. So, I mean, the Jays have a very strong catching tandem here. Gabby Moreno, great catcher as well. But I don't think we need to pretend that the Jays are in like a bad spot here at all. No, not at all. Uh, the, the Nate Pearson thing, I wanted to get your thoughts on that really quickly as well. Um, do you think there's a chance both him and Manoa come back on this team next season? Or do you think, like, when you go and read through, you know, who are some trade chips that are out there that maybe the Jays could be interested in? I think a lot of times the easy return to imagine is that the team who's moving off from, whether it's an experienced bat or whatever, looks at the Jays and goes, oh, we want one of Manoa. Or if it's a lesser name, we want to take a stab at Nate Pearson ourselves because the stuff is just so good. Yeah, that's an interesting one to consider is if you have Nate Pearson who's soon to be out of options next year, they can't send him down if he has a bad spring training. Maybe there's a team out there that has less depth in their bullpen and their in their pitching staff in general in the upper minors than the Jays do. And the Jays go ahead and swap Nate Pearson for a bat. And it just makes more sense for them to have, you know, a, 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 a position player on their bench that can't be optioned as opposed to him. I don't know. I'm just kind of spitballing ideas. But they've, you know, they've hung on to him for a very long time and they've they've leaned into the upside. They've accepted that he's not going to be a starter. They're trying to make it work as a reliever there's a lot of things that look really good for Pearson. He, you know, throws so hard. He's got the really good spin rate. People talk about that. Uh, he was healthy last year by and large. He hasn't racked up many innings in his career, but last year he was, and the results just weren't spectacular. They were just, they were fine. He had a, a few stretches where he looked good. And then every once in a while would just get completely lit up. And it, it really does remind me a lot of Julian Merriweather. It feels like almost the exact same thing, but it feels like the Jays have sunk so much effort into Nate, Nate Pearson that they're going to try and make it happen next year. It's going to be one of those things we talk about. It's a pitcher who can't be optioned. So we're just going to see if it works. And I wouldn't be surprised if no matter how he pitches in spring training, if he's on the roster to, to open things up in, in April. All right, I want to quickly, before we wrap up the pod, get your thoughts on maybe the chances of the Jays making a big trade. Obviously, we remember the big deal from last year. A couple years ago, it was Matt Chapman right before the season started. There's a few names floating out there. Like, there's teams that are on blow-up watch, where it's like, okay, they might be ready to rip this thing down. I think the Mets are one of them. We're hearing talk that Pete Alonzo's maybe on the block. One guy in New York I'd be interested in is Jeff McNeil. Again, the versatility kind of fits what the Jays might want. He's a second baseman. He can play outfield as well. He's got a really good contract. Three years left with $41.75 million remaining on that deal. So, like, relatively cost-effective. 
The Mets told those pitchers they moved at the deadline that, hey, we're not planning on competing in 2024. Our eyes are on 2025, so it makes sense that they could maybe move McNeil. The other name, and our producer Brett brought him up to me before the start, is Jonathan India. The Reds have an absolutely crowded infield right now with a ton of really, really good young talent there. Obviously, that's why they aren't bringing back Joey Votto because like, we can't promise this guy playing time. There's a little bit of talk that Jonathan India could be available on the block. If you could get one of India or McNeil, I think you give up probably a decent amount for him. I think those are two guys who just instantly make your team that much better, and they both have pretty safe floors. Yeah, I think he, Jonathan India won the Rookie of the Year. He was a he was a high draft pick by Cincinnati a few years ago, and he comes in, wins Rookie of the Year. And since then, he he hasn't really hit his stride and maintained that consistency as an all-star caliber player. But despite that, even without his Rookie of the Year numbers, he's still an above-average second baseman. I mean, the Jays haven't had that everyday second baseman since Marcus Semien was here on the one-year contract, and they've been doing the platoon thing with Wit with um, Biggio, Espinal, Schneider had that spot too. Lots of different players, but I mean, that, there's a lot of upside there. But I, 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 it really does feel like the Jays are pretty adamant on that group of Buffalo guys that they have that they can bring up. And I'd, I'd be surprised to see them move from what's now like a pretty thin farm system because they made so many trades to. To, to fill a spot like that where there's some younger guys in the minors, like a, like, a, like a Schneider, we've mentioned his name a few times, kind of feels like based on the finish that he had last season, he deserves some rope to start and to try and see if he can be close to that again and be an everyday major league second baseman. I, I kind of feel like this is going to be the offseason where we don't see the Jays very involved in the trade market. Like you said, there was, there's was there been so many. I think the Barrios trade a few years ago, Chapman, like you mentioned, even this year, they had to give up a couple of pretty good prospects to get Jordan Hicks. Uh, they gave up prospects to get Mitch White last year. Like they've made so many trades in the past few years that the farm system's pretty thin. So it wouldn't be surprising to see them kind of stand pat and just have a run it back with what we have in the upper minors plus some big ads and free agency. That's kind of what I see coming. So we're not doing the Juan Soto thing? Unfortunately not. It's uh, I, I would love Juan Soto on the Jays, but unfortunately I think he's probably a Yankee. I don't think the Yankees are going to sign Otani and they're like, that's our guy. We're going to trade for Soto and sign him long term. We're going to have three guys that are big hitters that should be DHs. Yeah, I mean, you kind of the talk with the Yankees all season. The reason people hated Brian Cashman is because they haven't had a good left fielder in like a decade there or whatever. So that seems to be one way to kind of quiet your critics if you're Cashman is to like go fill that spot with yeah. Juan Soto, the best one on the market. So yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Juan Soto in the AL East. Why not? Why not? Uh, all right, Coombsy, I think the plan for us is to kind of do one of these every like seven to 10 ish days as news breaks as well. So people can uh, oh, make sure you're hitting the subscribe button, obviously, wherever you get your podcast from or find us on YouTube, because I know our boy Brett's going to be putting out some free agent reaction content out there as well. But people will still hear from us throughout the month of November. And as we head up closer, obviously, to the winter meetings. Free agency is going to open on Tuesday morning, I think at like 10 Eastern time or something. And we will record a podcast at noon that day after the Blue Jays announced they have signed Shoei Otani to a 10-year, $500 million contract. We'll be back then. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. We'll, and then we'll just clip this part with the date stamp on it, and the podcast will go viral. All right, that's a wrap. Big shout-out to Batano. The game starts now at batano.ca, 19+. plus. Please play responsibly. Shout-out to Brett for producing this bad boy, and you as well, Coombs. You will chat again in a week. Best wishes. Thanks for tuning in to Blue Jays Nation Radio. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode.